good evening, everybody. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Coral Black. I'm the university librarian. And it is our delight today to welcome everybody to the Bull Library um, and to tonight's event with John Robb as we delve into his recent book, The Art of Darkness, The History of the Goth. Um, and firstly, I'd just a couple of thank yous. So John and Emmett, thank you very much for bringing this event to UCC and to Cork. And to Martin, who many of you will know for coordinating the event. He's our, uh, he's our music guru, I think, in the library here. It is great to see so many people, uh, but not a surprise because uh, just on my early conversation with John, we've definitely got a treat in store, and I'm sure tonight's going to be very entertaining. And look, just uh, you know, from a library perspective, events like this are hugely important. It allows us to show people that... You know, we are more than just a place to study, um, more than just a place for books. We're a place where we can bring people together. And I'm hoping tonight that we have some of our students here. I know we have some of our library staff, our researchers, but actually, really importantly, our community beyond the university. Because we really look to build that community and bring people in to hear expert talks like this. Um, to facilitate that kind of connection and discussion um, and just a sharing of views. Tonight's event is particularly uh, kind of important to us. It aligns really nicely with our Shush radio show. Uh, for those of you who listen, you will know that the library team actually are probably as passionate about music as they are about their books. Um, and so we do look forward to holding many, many more events like this. Um, so now I'll, uh, I'll introduce John. Uh, for many of you, I'm sure he needs no introduction. I'm obviously delighted. He doesn't quite hail from exactly where I'm from, but we are definitely from the same neck of the woods. I'm from, I always say Liverpool, but it's Wallasey, uh, and John is from Blackpool, uh, but he did live in Liverpool for a few weeks in his early years. Originally a musician, uh, best known as the founder bass player of uh, the mid-1980s post-punk band uh, The Membranes. He now runs uh, the Louder Than War website, has written many best-selling books, including Punk Rock, An Oral History, Manchester, The North Will Rise Again, uh, and this book, The Art of Darkness, The History of the Goth. He's a journalist, TV and radio presenter, public speaker. He's also one of the founders of the eco-education scheme, Green Britain Academy, a movement with a vision to support the creation of 700,000 green jobs in the UK by 2030. Uh, an amazing uh, vision for them to have. And they work with employers um, and with employees and uh, people worldwide. Um, he heads up Louder Than Work, the UK's biggest music and book festival. Um, and so, without further ado, everybody, uh, put your hands together for John Robb. Yeah, that's enough about me anyway. Oh, look, the mic's broken already, just proper punk rock style. You put your hand on things and they just crackle and crunch and break. Anyway, so I'm here to talk about the art of darkness, the history of goth. People often ask me, why did I write a book about goth? Well, and there has been books about goth before, but there were academic books about goth. And I know I'm in a university and I shouldn't really say this, but I find a lot of music culture books written in an academic way a little too dry. I think they have a valuable place. I think they're important. But I want to write a pop culture book, a book that you could read, even if you didn't really know about goth or you weren't interested in goth, but a book that you could get immersed in. That was, that was an entertaining ride, but also turned you on to the music. Because I say to, this, to people all the time who read the book or are going to read the book, is every single band that you come across in the book, please listen to it. Because at the end of the day, I mean, as a writer, you're almost like a parasite, really. The uh, musicians are the ones who really matter, the ones who create the soundtrack for the culture. And we know there's like 15, probably 15 to 20, the main bands, the big bands that are right about in the book, who are the pillars of the scene. They're kind of known beyond that scene and into mainstream culture. But what's one of the great things about this scene and several other scenes is the smaller bands, the cult bands that tend to get lost and that they're equally good. I and mean, a lot of people haven't really heard them. So it's worth listening, trying to get immersed in them and find about the music, you know, the music that was a backdrop to all of this. So the interesting thing about goth is that it's a scene that never really existed. So every single band, every single person and every single band who's an icon in the scene hates the term. So hence Susie, who's the number one goth icon, absolutely, absolutely totally hates the term goth. 
And the reason for this is that most of the bands who became the pillars of what goth is had formed two, three, up to six years before there was such a thing as a goth scene. Because goth was a retrospective term for a scene that already existed. It's just a lot of people fumbling and finding their way out of the punk rock thing. Because for people of my age, the punk thing was like such a, uh, an incredible explosive moment. It was, it was a tear in the fabric that you could just about get through and create your own little micro world on the other side. For the people in London who were right in the middle of that scene and the eye of the hurricane, it must have been amazing. But for a lot of us, we, we were there. You know, we, London was a place where you went on a school trip to when you were about 14. Our school trip to London, and the only time we'd been to London, was to the Jimmy Savile show. <laughs> like, like going into hell. Although nobody, I don't think anybody at the time knew much about Jimmy Savile, but we did think he was a pretty strange person to be pop culture's main representative in the mainstream. That's as far as we they went at that point in time. So that was our experience of London. So when punk, so when I was a kid, glam rock was the main kind of music that we really loved, and glam was it was um, I was a glam rock kid, but you didn't dress as a glam rock kid because it's impossible to dress as a glam rock kid growing up in a town like Blackpool, which was like a very much of a middle of nowhere town. You think if you think if you're in Cork and you're at the end of the end of the beyond, Blackpool felt like that as well, stuck out on the end of a peninsula. Well, you couldn't, you couldn't even get uh, trousers that, that weren't flared. You know, you had to learn how to take your trousers in. I learned to stitch badly when I was 15. And I still stitch, you say, now big one-inch stitches, just desperately trying to get second-hand clothes to like, look vaguely punk rock. I mean, it wasn't like we couldn't go to the sex shop in London. It was just too far away for us, you know. And it was, so the northern experience punk was very different. But a lot of people I interviewed in the book also had the same, similar kind of experience to this as well. So when I interviewed the people out of Bauhaus, they'd grown up in a town called Northampton. And I think a lot of this, a lot of the culture talk about here in post-punk and in goth was people in small towns trying to, get, trying to do punk and trying to get the punk experience with like limited resources. And somehow ending with something, if not equally good, but somehow better in a sense. By getting it wrong, they got it incredibly right. So Bauhaus Group in Northampton, when I was actually in Northampton uh, three days ago, Saturday, God, this is trouble being on tour all the days, have two blur into one. And um, they just opened a museum of punk rock culture in Northampton, which was an amazing space. And I love these kind of like museums. You know, you go in there and the people, obviously Bauhaus was a big part of that exhibition, but it's also all the other local bands, the bands that you never heard of. And just, just what at the time were like 16 year old kids who got into punk rock and trying to make their, trying to make their Northampton version of it and pictures of them and little recorded, uh, they recorded lots of their stories. And I, I always love the people's stories because I think that's often where the real action can be in things. But the Bauhaus section was really interesting as well because in, in a sense, even though Bauhaus became a game changing band and perhaps the ultimate goth band, even though they're not a goth band, remember nobody's a goth band, but well, you have to write a 600 page book to explain why so that's just over there yeah so but Bauhaus in that context are really interesting they were just another local band just one that happened to make it so they had all their equipment and they had Bella Goes Is Dead which is their first single incredibly defining track a wonderful piece of music and the great guitar sounds in that track have gone through this little thing called a, a copycat which is an old school piece of equipment which is a little piece of a cassette, it's like a cassette that goes round in a loop, which sort of fakes an echo sound. So the great guitar sounds that Daniel Ash were getting on that track were partially from that, and there it was in the uh, exhibition. It was the thing I was most excited about seeing, you know, because I've listened to that record so many times over the years, to actually see the battered effects unit that actually created that sound was, was quite something. Now that record, that song, they written in their first rehearsal. So uh, the short, uh, there's a few people I know in bands in this room. So how many people have been in a band in this room? It's not that embarrassing. You can put your hand up, you know. <laughs> a few, about six. So you know, like the first rehearsal when you go there and everyone's scrapping over who's going to have to be the drummer. <laughs> or like the guitar player or the bass player. Everybody's got a role they want in a band. But Bauhaus went to their first rehearsal and wrote Bella Goes, He's Dead. So they said to the drummer at the time, who was 16, you know, can you, he had two beats he'd learned. He'd learned, you know, straight rock beat and a bossa nova beat. He said, just do that, bossa nova beat. 
then they put the bass line on, which is nicked off a glam rock classic, actually, the descending bass line. But that, I, if you know, it's really obvious. If you don't know, it's like tantalizingly close. And then Daniel Ash made these amazing sounds on the guitar over the top. And then they gave Peter Murphy the lyrics and he sang them. And within half an hour, they'd written a song that was a fulcrum song of what went before to what went afterwards. And probably often, often these things people will say, what is to me, what would be the ultimate track that you would term goth, even though it's not goth. And it would be Bella Lugosi's Dead because it has a darkness to it, a shivering darkness to it. You can dance to it. The kick drums on a 4 4, so it's dum, dum. Dum, dum. Everybody can dance to that. So it's like very basic. So even though it doesn't feel like a dance track, because it feels like an esoteric kind of dub, there's something to it that's got like this kind of swing. So it's a perfect club track because you, the, one of the keys to goth music is you have to be able to dance to it because it's all about the clubs. And it's got like lyrics, so kind of macabre, but also quite tongue in cheek at the same time. So it's kind of spooky and dangerous, but also kind of weirdly like dark fun. So they make it, and it's nine minutes long, and three weeks later they go and record a demo of it, and that becomes the single. So about three months afterwards they, could, they put it out. As the first single, putting a nine-minute song out as your first single is really sticking your neck out as well. Because for some reason, and they do this to this day, radio, which is run by people who know nothing about music often, insists that songs have to be three minutes long or they won't play them on the radio, which is a really odd concept, because you can imagine... You know, if you've heard Bella Lugosi's Dead, you could not have that as three minutes. It takes three minutes before the vocals come in. The whole beauty of that song is it's a smouldering piece of tension that never gets resolved. I mean, that's... And it works as that. You, you couldn't put another minute on. You couldn't take a minute off. It's an absolute perfect piece of music. And the idea that the radio would tell you you have to, like, make it one-third of a version of it seems utterly ridiculous. Luckily, at that time, we had a DJ called John Peel, which some of the older people in this room may remember. They would play, almost deliberately play, rule-breaking records, and he championed that song and, and created a space for a breakthrough. Now, the thing is, Bauhaus got terrible reviews in the music press. The music press really hated them. And that's one of the reasons, that going back to why did I write the book, I thought it's time, I mean, there were, there were a few champions of them, but they're not enough, you know. And I wanted to champion what they did. Because often when I would have conversations with people, you know, people always have, you know, talk about the music you like and what's cool to like and not cool to like. And I've noticed that over the years they've rewritten the music of that punk and post-punk period to not include all the bands. So Simon Reynolds did a brilliant book about post-punk. But, but the one weak spot, and Simon will actually admit that, this himself, is that the stuff I was writing about in my book, he didn't really get that kind of music. So he gives it a nod. It's like a small chapter. I thought it's, it's worth more than a nod because these bands, and most of them were bigger than most of the post-punk bands, and probably more influential as well, arguably. So it's, And I wanted to champion what bands like Bauhaus did and guitar players like Daniel Ash, who's like, to me, one of the great guitar players. He doesn't play riffs and he doesn't play solos. He just makes cool little weird noises. And he'd been to art school in Northampton. And I always think he, he plays guitar like a painter. He makes each guitar bit is like a colour or a dab on, 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 you know, like you've got a painting, put the yellow on like that, and it suddenly becomes amazing. It goes vivid, comes to life, and it's got like sort of a textural, emotional feel that it didn't have before. That's how he plays guitar, which does sound really pretentious, but I think when you talk about music, it should be pretentious. It should be pretending to be something beyond reality. Murky, grey reality is not something I want to hear when I hear records. I want to hear the, be the beyond, you know, the, the out there-ness, which is, probably goes back to being a glam rock kid in the 70s, where in the 70s, we... The 70s now, when I think about it, promised everything and delivered nothing. But the one place where it did deliver everything was in pop culture, which is like an amazing time to grow up. And glam rock was so key, and glam rock was a massive influence on Bauhaus and on goth itself. So goth is really dark glam. It's like glam in black clothes, black music, or whatever. But it kept, a lot of those people have grown up in the glam era. And glam, again, it's been sort of reduced just to David Bowie, which, I mean, arguably, he, I mean, not even arguably, he was the key artist of the 70s. I mean, everything does start with David Bowie. But there was a lot of other people involved as well. I always equally love Mark Boland. I think probably at the end of the day, I'll probably listen to Mark Boland more than I listen to David Bowie just because I love his songs and I love the way he could conjure up shimmering magic out of thin air. You know, I've even gone, become so fanished that I got... Um, 
you can get like these cool little bootlegs and rehearsing and just start a song in one chord and start singing and you go whoa i don't know this song it sounds magical and you'll just go stop and then go into another song it's like wow you just threw that away and for every other person who's ever been in a band that'd be the piece of gold that you've been searching for and he was just chucking them away. It just seemed like the music poured out of him. But the big difference was with David Bowie. David Bowie had a cultural idea of what he was about. So, so whereas Boland, when Mark Boland, he was instinctively cultural because he'd gone through the mob thing and he saw the hippie thing and the, the hippie poet thing and then he'd done the glam rock thing. He invented glam rock. He started glam rock. But David Bowie saw what he was doing and took it to another level and made it into a cultural force. So David Bowie's interviews in the 70s were a crash course, you know, for for people like us growing up in small towns, you know, we weren't that, we weren't cool at all. We we found out about, you know, the Stooges or we found out about Iggy Pop or William Burroughs or or Can or or Brian Eno. We known he'd been in Roxy Music, of course, the cool looking one in Roxy Music. But Bowie kind of pointed us in the direction of the solo records and I think for for somebody who was thirteen or fourteen, that was a that was a brilliant cultural jump, because you always get like a, I think always in pop culture, there's one massive band that opens the doors to the beyond, literally the doors. We'll get onto them in a minute, but it's like um, you because when you grow up and you 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 know there's the stuff in the charts and you're watching Top of the Pops, which was the main British TV program at the time, and you know there's always two or three glam things on there that you really liked. But he didn't know there was something beyond that. And when, and that's what Bowie did. He opened the doors to the beyond and the possibilities of being of the beyond as well. The one thing he didn't open the doors to, which wasn't his fault and not his calling, was the fact that you could get involved in this, you know. So, you know, growing up as a kid in a sort of nowhere town, the pop culture was something that happened in London or out of space. And the, to us, that was all the same thing, you know, because like I said, the only time we'd been in London was to go to the Jimmy Savile show. <laughs> and and to um and was, London was somewhere so far away, you know, it just seemed so exotic that it was it was nothing to do with us. We thought we'll never go back there again. And pop culture always comes from there. We didn't realise that you could get involved and that was the great thing about punk. It challenged you to go out and do it yourself. You know, well that we misread it actually, because I don't think it really meant to do that. I think that, you know, p- the the bigger bands would say you know, go on everybody, you go and do it. And we they probably didn't mean that, so we did, you know, so everybody did it really badly. You know, like, you know, we were probably typical of all those kind of bands. I mean, a lot of bands I spoke to went through the same process. You do your first gig on a stage like this, you know, you never played in amps before, you didn't know what chords were, scales, you didn't know how to tune a guitar up, you just started playing and see what would come out. You know, it was it was very naive. And somehow out of that, you fumbled your own route out of it. And nearly all the bands in the book have gone through the same process. Not the older bands who come, come in at the beginning of the punk thing, but the bands who came in 79, 80 in the post-punk period. So glam rock, going back to glam rock, was was, was it was amazing. It was it was a soundtrack to, to my youth, you know. And it's like, as much as I love Bowie and T-Rex, and I could sort of say Starman by David Bowie was a life-changing moment for me, but it wasn't really. It was for a lot of people in the book. But I was nowhere near that cool. For me, it was just this... I'm probably about a couple of years younger than a lot of the people I'm speaking to, but it was just um, it was the whole thing, you know. I didn't, I couldn't differentiate between the good and the bad glam. It was all really good, you know. So sweet, Mott the Hoople, Slade, even Mud, you know, even all these bands that are like you meant to have a guilty pleasure about liking, would just seem really magical coming at us, sat there glued to the TV once a week watching Top of the Pops, and this was kind of forming the base, the base of possibility that. Punk sort of set fire to, and it went through to the next phase, which was interesting. All the journeys that came out of punk, and how everybody kind of used punk, didn't kind of use it, but it got really into punk, and somehow it meshed with the stuff they're into before to get into the next parts. And punk sort of splintered into lots of little different, like kind of micro scenes. And the book itself, so I start at the beginning. So where is the beginning of goth? So you know, where do you start? I thought I would start the first recorded. Uh, use of the word goth, which was the fall of Rome in the year 411. So when the goths ransacked Rome, running through the streets of Rome, all the all the locals, there weren't many of them left then because it was a decaying city. They're all they're all looking out the windows. They're shouting, "Who are you? Who are you?" And they're going, "We are not goths." <laughs> I just made that bit up. I wish I'd put that in the book though. <laughs> 
But he gave Europe this idea that there was a dark culture out there, you know, sinister dark culture, which Europe seems to never be able to shake off this idea, does it? But at that point in time, they thought the sinister dark culture was coming out of Germany and South Sweden, which is where the Goths actually had come from, and they had infiltrated the Roman Empire for decades. And they, they basically just wanted to settle there, but the Romans wouldn't let them, so they got pissed off and sat in the capital in the end. So the, the Goths became this kind of byword for darkness and fear, you know. And so when the Germans were building their own cathedrals and refused to build them in classical style, the snobs, you know, the classical snobs, which we still have to this day, looked down with complete disdain of the, uh, their German architecture and called it Gothic. So instead of like going, OK, we're going to deconstruct this cathedral and build it in classical style instead, they celebrated and built more, and they made art and music and poetry to match that, that kind of celebrated their version of a European kind of culture, you know, their own, their own style, their own look, their own paintings, etc. So I wrote about all that for about uh, the first third of the book and the romantic poets and the, and the artists and the painters because I thought it was important in this story because I think more than probably nearly every other uh, music culture, goth has a long history. So in the UK um, and with a lot of help from Ireland as well because probably most, probably a very big percentage of the game-changing musicians in Britain have Irish blood in them. It's interesting, actually, and this is just a slight tangent, but when you look at Manchester and you look at the parents of all the, all the key Manchester musicians, they all seem to come from here. <laughs> and they went to Manchester and completely changed the culture away from what it was before into something completely different. So but all the sort of... The UK and Ireland, this, our little corner, our windswept, rain-swept corner, it's completely brilliant at inventing uh, pop cultures, you know, music cultures, more than any other country in the world. Because it, it's that whole equation, it's the clothes, the music, the lifestyle equation, means everything. And there's a tradition of the dandy kind of goes in there as well, and it's about dressing up and not dressing down. And even the bands that dress down, it's like an awful lot of work to dress down, you know. It had to, had, you had to dress down in the right way. It's not like the American bands, this is a generalisation of course, you know, jeans, T-shirts, and all the bands, you can't tell what style of music they're playing uh, if you look at pictures of them. But the British bands, you could always work at, you know, the style, the music, and the clothes always go together. Because I remember seeing all the pictures of the punk bands in 1976 in uh, the music papers, but you couldn't hear them because they hadn't put any records out. But the early pictures, you kind of knew what they sounded like just by looking at them. You, you knew, the clothes are linear and angular, and you knew the music was going to be like that as well. So when I first heard it, of course it was an amazing, like the shock of the new, and it's powerful. But then there's another part of you goes, I knew it would sound like that in, in your head. You know, you felt it, you saw it coming from a distance. So the pop culture thing was really important in the UK. It's not just soundtrack, it's a whole thing mixed together. And, and this has kind of been, you know, from the Teddy Boys onwards and from before that, the cloth cap gangs, you know, Peaky Blinders and beyond that. Was, you know, every city would have these, like, really dressed up, like, youth rampaging around it, which, which to this day is like, because a lot of the thing a lot of older people now will say, oh, it's like, where, where are all the youth tribes now? But they're all still there. They've just got different versions. And, and what's really incredibly important when you're a 16-year-old means nothing to a 60-year-old, you know, so... When I was a kid, if you had slightly the wrong trousers on or the wrong pair of socks on, it could mean you'd get beaten up. You know, it was really the most important thing in the world. But to older people, you just all look the same. They wouldn't be able to tell goths, psychobillies, second wave punks apart. It just looked like a bunch of weird kids, you know. So don't forget that when you get older. <laughs> that culture doesn't only occur when you happen to be 16. It's just, we just that was our little staging post and it continued afterwards. So the style of it was really important, and also the history. I think the history is really important here. So a lot of British youth cultures, I mean, like the Teds, obviously, have been, you know, there is a bit of historical you know, backdrop to that because they, it started off in public schools, people copying the clothes of Edwardian dandies from the early part of the 19th century. And then somehow, you know, this really kind of, kind of camp look, really, really appealed to lots of tough kids in the East End of London and completely took the look and made it their own, which is one of the great sort of weird sort of crossovers, almost equally weird to when Kraftwerk crossed over to all the black kids in New York and helped to make electro music, then feeding into hip hop. You get these kind of weird things we not expect, you know, something from there, suddenly goes over there and completely twists the way people think about life and culture and music. So this has been so very much part of the equation for a very long time. So when you get into punk, the, the look outside London is much more DIY. 
and then I wrote about this in the um, after after all the history bit, you know, the three two thousand years of history, kind of coming up to it. In fact, I'll do this in chronological order. So, darkness to me, there's a, there's, there is an art of darkness, and it goes through every generation. And everybody's fascinated by the melancholy, aren't they? And it doesn't mean people get immersed in it because one, this another thing I wanted to deconstruct was the cliche of, of goths. It's not a bunch of morose kids, you know. Maybe a bunch of introverted kids. It may be uh, kids who actually like reading books, which is rare in music culture because reading books wasn't a big part of punk rock. You know, punk rock was so fast and everyone was so off their heads. There was no time to read a book. But when goth came along, it became much more. Well, I'm not saying like you went to a club and everyone stood there reading a the book, you know. The clubs were like fantastically decadent, debauched, great nights out. You know, people had really good fun. The music, it was dark music you could dance to, you know, which is probably one of the best equations ever. The darkness gives it like a heavy, heavy weightness, doesn't it? It gives it an emotional clout. And, and it's, I'm not, it's naturally it's going to be dark because while we live in an inclement place, everything's gloomy. It's just... It's not like everyone goes in a room, let's go, let's like a song about the weather. It just kind of seeps into you, doesn't it, you know, and it's, um, and all that, and it's, and it's attractive, and when you embrace it, it's fascinating. And, the, and probably the most fascinating things to sing about are sex and death, you know, the two key fundamental parts of human life, you know. And they, they do make great poetic metaphors, and there's so many different cool words you can use writing about them. And they really connect powerfully with people as well, you know. So that's all in there. So you've got this kind of like, Every generation is kind of dealing with its blues in different kinds of ways. So whether it was Lord Byron having his ghost stories competition and by uh, Geneva in 1820, I think I got the year wrong, I think it was 1819, uh, and they come up Frankenstein and Dracula, those that amazing 48 hours when obviously they weren't on any drugs at all, were they? <laughs> Laudanum. I'm, 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 what is Laudanum? I want to try that out, you know, because you read about all these romantic poets and they're all taking Laudanum and they all do these amazing psychedelic poems and it's not something you can get now. It's not like you can go into Manchester and hang out and buy laudanum off somebody. You know, I, you know the gangster turf wars over laudanum. They've died out a long time ago, haven't they? <laughs> Maybe we'll try it out. Somebody, somebody in this room might have some. It could be an interesting night. So, so it was about every generation dealing with its blues and its kind of art of its time. So whether it was painting, whether it was like poetry, whether it was literature to them, or in the late 70s, or post-war periods, when electric rock and roll was a predominant kind of culture, and also the most easy culture to get into, to actually be able to do. I mean, you could think, I, I feel a bit melancholic today, I might do a bit of a, I might do some carving, I might make a statue. Now, that'd be pretty difficult for most of us. We're not trained in being, doing sculpture. It's, it's very technical. I mean, obviously, music's very technical, but it's a very low bar entry point, like there was when my band got into it. That you basically, you just plug in and hit things, and you're making some kind of statement, which eventually will make some kind of sense. So that was very appealing. Everybody wanted to be in a band as well, and it was the predominant art form of, of that period. It's probably less so now, even though there's probably more bands now than ever, but social media has really taken a huge sort of creative space or a, a statement space that used to be more in music. So coming in after the war, there's like, you know, you've got rock and roll and all that, but there's a dark side, there's an undercurrent. You know, in the 60s as well, you get brilliant songs like the Rolling Stones, Painted Black, which is like such a great title, you know, and it's... Uh, it's almost, it's, it's, it's almost like a title of a goth book, you know, they, they, they were there with that, it's a really amazing song. But the first band to really make the change and make the jump and go into a much darker place was The Doors. And their first gig in New York in 1967, the reviewer said they had gothic overtones to their music. So it's the first mention of the word gothic in terms of rock and roll. So some people have said to me, well, I don't understand why The Doors in your book, they're not a goth band. Well, I say to them, there are no goth bands. There's no such thing as a goth band, for one. And two, most of the bands you think are goth were never called goth, but the Doors were actually called gothic. So, <laughs> so the Doors do have a big stake, a big claim. And also, an influential, massive influence of what was going to come later on. I mean, Jim Morrison had a baritone. He was fascinated by the romantic poets. He's into sex and death, dressed in black. And the band made a funereal, dark sound as well. And when you hear a track like The End, it's got to be almost the first proto kind of goth track. It's long track, it's droning, it's atmospheric, it's filmic, it's, it's shiveringly dark, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a brilliant song, you know, it's a timeless, timeless brilliant song. In fact, the best version of it is a live version you can see on YouTube from a gig in Canada. It's a really amazing version, full of tension, 
and fear is just really good. So then you scap scapulated all that. You said there's a definite line you could draw from Lord Byron to Jim Morrison and maybe onto Nick Cave and lots of other lesser known people in the goth period as well. That kind of poetic um, embrace of the darkness and, and poetry and all that, that kind of thing planted in the culture by the doors. Now, the interesting thing about the doors was in America they were huge, you know, so. They were at that time when they were going the late sixties, number one albums, playing crowds five thousand a night. But in the UK they were much smaller. They only had like one and a half hits over here. Is and then they only ever played the Roundhouse twice and the Isle of Wight a couple of years later and that was that was it. And then Jim Morrison died in Paris. So they they were known, but they weren't huge, like a big cult band, but they weren't like they weren't like Beatles size, whereas in America they were close to being that kind of Beatles Stones kind of space. But what, what hit the most people in my generation, The Doors, it was sort of semi-forgotten. I knew about them because a lot of my Magic Mushroom hippie mates were really into them. And you go to their houses and they play them. So we got into them in the punk days and, and really got into the master. But in 79, a film called Apocalypse Now came out and there's a really great scene in it where they uh, recreate the napalm from uh, Vietnam in a forest in uh, the Philippines because they, they weren't allowed to do it in Vietnam. And over the... Um, the burning flames, which look beautiful but environmentally pretty bad, I would imagine. They play the end, and it's an incredibly powerful piece of footage, you know. I mean, the film itself is incredibly powerful. It became a really big cult film, very popular with a lot of people in the post-punk period, because on one level it's an anti-war film, but on the other level it's one of the greatest psychedelic films ever made. It's, 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 a, it's funny in a very dark kind of way, and, it, and it's... And it, and people, well... Everyone used to go around to your house and take magic mushrooms and watch um, Apocalypse Now. It didn't do anybody any harm, that at all. So the, the end began to seep in to the culture of that, of that time. And the, all that, those, the adventures in post-punk music that were going on, the end by, and, the, and the doors themselves and the end, the track, really seemed to fit. They seemed to capture the same kind of atmospheres. Now, it's not like they became like a huge post-punk band. They just sort of hovered in the background. And I think that makes them one of the key influences on what became the, uh, the goth scene, you know. So they, because they brought a level of darkness into an experimental uh, period of music where culture was in a flux and, and anything was up for grabs as well, you know. So people trying to make music and fumbling and feeling the way out of punk and with this kind of like sort of darkness over here from the 60s with um, current darkness that we're living through in the UK in 1979 because you have to remember that was a really sort of dismal period in Britain in the UK maybe, I don't know it's not maybe different here but in the UK at that time in fact it was worse here wasn't it but in the UK we had a Tory government and it looked like we're drifting towards nuclear war with Russia it's really hard to imagine those times now isn't it <laughs> but which actually, which actually brings us on to another story because uh, one that what I did um, in the next part of the book, I go through different chapters. Um, after, so we go to a golf club. We all go to a golf club together in the book. So I do about forty pages in a golf club in insane detail because I, I like detail and I think it's really important in a book. And I wanted people to feel like they were in the epicenter, in the heart and soul of golf culture, which was the club, and it was about the dance floor. And the music, you had to be able to dance to it, like I was saying before. And one another th key influence in, in the music was it was it was it came from black music, a lot of it. But there's a massive influence of black music in there, which most people don't really pick up on. So like disco, uh, dub and funk were all key tenants to like the goth sound. Because you had to dance to it, you had to have a, a sensual flexibility to it. It, didn't, it couldn't be rigid like rock, you had to move to it. And so every goth club you went to, there'd be the dance floor, people would be dancing on it. it I mean, it, if you ever went to a punk club, which there weren't many of, very few, it, everybody'd be like too wired and just waiting for the band to come on. They, you know, they'd be fighting, lots of young kids scrapping, because every gig in Blackpool's like that, it'd be Blackpool v Preston, and then, then Morecambe would turn up, and everyone would be going, oh my God, Morecambe are here, and Morecambe are the scariest town, which I find really hard to imagine. It's like when you go there now, it's, it's desolate and just about full of grannies, there's nothing there. I thought, how, did these, how could these ever be so scary when we were younger? But that's what punk gigs are like in the north of England. But goth clubs were a different kind of environments. You didn't really see fights in goth clubs. People there to dance, people there to dress up, people were there to get completely immersed in the culture. It was fluid, and that was what was really good about it. It was a place where people could express themselves in every, every single way possible. And it was the first place you ever went to 
as a young boy, a young man, where girls went in and shared the toilets. Girls would come in the boys' toilets and boys would go in the girls' toilets, which was not, something that never really happened before. Because remember, this is the late 70s, early 80s, and we were living in Victorian England. It was, everything was so square. You know, so at first it was like, oh, God, I can't have a piss as a girl in here. But then it became kind of normal. And the boys would go in the girls' toilets because girls' toilets had mirrors, which you wouldn't get in a boys' toilet. So people could do their makeup. The boys could do their makeup. So things were changing. But they weren't changing that fast outside the clubs because I remember, like, you know, you, you, you had to get your style from, you know, Oxfam shops, second-hand shops. So it was a lot of his second-hand clothes reconstituted into what looks you want, with made up little bits of details, you know, like... You could get a tiny bit of jewellery. You could go second. Um, you could go in old jewellery shops and get bits of stuff that fitted. And then somebody went to London and bought a cool belt. Then they, they went back six months later, bought ten for everybody else. That kind of thing was going on. Um, but then you said, "Well, I might get my ears pierced," but um, but you couldn't get your ears pierced in Blackpool because you wouldn't pierce your ears if you're a bloke. So you had to do it yourself. So that ear, I put the cork, bit of cork in the back, a compass, boiled it in water put the compass in a slit and I got it wrong. So to this day, it's vertical. So if I put an earring in there, it, it hangs in a really weird, weird way. This side, though, I, I don't know why I did it, but I put two in and I got it right and I put it slightly too close to each other. So I could have slipped there and I just have a big hole. But, but that's how you had to do it then because you, you could not get them pierced properly because um, people with pierced ears were not pierced the boys' ears in Blackpool in England at that time. Might have been different here. I don't know. But in London, you definitely probably could have got it done properly. I mean, maybe you should have gone to London instead of risking hepatitis. <laughs> Just get the ears done. So, but, the, but it's, it's interesting that, um, out, you know, outside the big cities, how much of a catalyst the, the this kind of freak culture was for changing a whole country. So when I wrote the chapter on the Virgin Prunes, I wrote about, I was writing about a different island, a different island from the one probably, like, probably most people in this room have grown up in. I mean, even the first time I came in in 1984, Five, I think it's the first time I came to Cork. It's a completely different city to what it is now. Of course, it had culture there at the time. And there was great bands that came out of Cork, like Micro Disney, Fiber Down to the Sea. There was definitely a scene, and we knew about it. We knew those bands and things. But it seemed like there were only 20 people in town kind of doing it. And it seemed like it was, just, it was an island that was changing then. But if you go back to, the, say, the late 70s, that was a very different place. Like, like a lot of English towns were. You know, the, the Manchester you see now is not the Manchester that Joy Division grew up in. Although there was a bit of space because they had a couple of good clubs, you know, the a couple of venues. And Whereas now it's 50 clubs, 50 venues. It's just, it's, it's, it's utterly a completely different thing, sparked by punk and post-punk culture, I would argue, in a sense. And so in a way, Virgin Prunes had sparked this kind of thing in Ireland. So Gavin Friday, who's one of the singers of Virgin Prunes, great, really interesting interview with Gavin. We did one in Dublin uh, three months ago as well. And he's, he's a really interesting talker. So he was a Bowie kid, one of his children of Ziggy, really, and, you know, obsessed with David Bowie, but in a place similar to where I was in, in Blackpool, which is ironic because Dublin actually means Blackpool in, uh, in Irish, doesn't it? It's the same thing. So <laughs> across the ocean, Blackpool's <laughs> the most gothic name you can have for a town. So, it, and he was saying, like, as a Bowie fan, you couldn't get the clothes. It's really hard to even get the records. And he was telling me that when punk... He'd gone to see, I think it was Bowie or Roxy, I can't remember which one. He went to see them play in London in late 75, and he, he put on his best flares, and he went down there all dressed up and got to the gig. And these amazingly exotic people just waltzed in, and he thought he instantly felt like he's from a wrong, the wrong century. And that was a Bromley contingent, but a very early version of them. And he took that in his head back to Dublin, and then he, with his small bunch of mates, they kind of recreated their own version of it, which was, you know, now known as the Lipton Village, which they created an imaginary village to go and live in. And in that village, there was two bands. One was the arty band, Virgin Prunes, and one was a big band in the village, U2. And somehow those two roles played out on the world stage <laughs> in, in completely everywhere in the whole space, because his best mate was obviously Bono, and all these guys at U2 and the Virgin Prunes were in this kind of little imaginary village. So they would walk around Dublin, all dressed up with eyeliner on, starting to wear dresses, like a, like an amazing looking freak show. And I think it's not like people saw them go, oh my God, let's let's update the country overnight. But I think the catalytic effect of that and culture is so powerful that the you know somebody sees them and the first time somebody walks down the street and they're coming towards them, they're going, 
oh god I can't even work out what this is but it affects people and it becomes a thing that affects one person joins in or one person does their version and gradually things start to change now Dublin has become one of the coolest cities in the world and the second coolest city in Ireland isn't it <laughs> <laughs> you're from Limerick but maybe I've been to Limerick <laughs> And, and, when they, and the, the shock value of that is, is important. It's the same thing with punk in England as well. You know, he told me about he told me about when punk came along, and you couldn't get punk records at all. You know, it's not like now culture is instant now. You can look everything up, can't you? Which is which is amazing. I prefer that. I know people always go, it's, "Oh, I wish it was like the old days, and it took you a month to get a record." I hated that. I hated waiting for the record to turn up because by the time the record had turned up, you got into something else. You go. Ugh. I'm into something else that I'm bored of this. So Gavin would have to go to Liverpool to go and buy the records for all the uh, 20, by then probably about 29 punks in Dublin. So he go, I'm going over to uh, Probe Records in Liverpool, I'm going to get some punk records. So what does everybody want? Like six full singles, uh, three of that, two of that, five of that. And he'd go over to Liverpool and fill up a suitcase full of seven inch singles and take it back to Dublin. Well, you know, everyone will pay for them in advance, obviously. And that, that's an example of how the culture is so isolated. You know, I think in that isolation, things really percolate as well. Imaginations run wild because instead of these kind of small towns like Northampton, like we talked about before, you know, or Dublin, instead of people just being submerged in the, um, the kind of greyness of it, in the conservative, conservative nature of it, reacting against it. It's, you know, and also when you put your band together, you're never going to make it. Because there aren't, there's only you and your mates into that music. There's no one else out there. So instead of watering it down, thinking I might get a hit, and I always feel sorry, in a way, for bands in London because they're actually in the music business. The music business is checking them out. You know, and there's a pressure to be commercial. But if you're in a place where there's no, no cares what you're doing, you actually do what you want, and that's where the great art comes from. You know. And when you hear the Virgin Prunes records, they sound like that. They sound amazing to this day. We're just actually we're just playing. We, on, a shush, on the show before, on the radio show, he's gone out as a podcast. Play Day Lancome as the first track, and then Virgin Prunes as the second track, because there's definitely a parallel thing going on there. That was, I mean, Lancome, obviously, everyone's heard Lancome, amazing band. You know, on one level, it's kind of it's kind of tried Irish music, but on a level, it's nothing like that at all. It's really out there. It's kind of like Swans or post punk, and it's but it's done for the now. It's not even it's not even post punk because that's 40 years ago. And when I listen to the melodies and their approach to music, I can hear Virgin Prunes in there. And Virgin Prunes were exotic and were far out, but there's also something very Irish about them as well, you know, maybe melodically, maybe their sensibility as well. And it's, and it's interesting their relationship with U2 as well, because obviously U2 ended up being the biggest band in the world. But, but um, Gavin Friday still works for U2, but he doesn't work for them, he works with them, I think that's... Because the gang, because the Lipton Village still sort of exists, and in a way, I always thought that the Lipton Village would make a great documentary, I don't know why nobody's ever done it. And so to this day, he works for them, he's like their art guy. But I think, there's a period, you know that period when U2 went a bit wacky, and they are obviously taking drugs and starting to do weird stuff like uh, pop and Zeropa and all that. That's when they sort of turned into the Virgin Prunes by, so without anybody noticing, the biggest band in the world was the Virgin Prunes under a different name. It's like the music had gone kind of off kilter and odd, but with that kind of groove that the Virgin Prunes had as well. So when Gavin Friday was going over to Liverpool to buy the records, which obviously from Dublin is your nearest port of call for, for at that time for culture and music, he had to go to Probe Records. Now, last week, the guy ran Probe Records, Jeff Davis, sadly died. And, and, the, and the woman who ran it, uh, Annie, Annie, she died three weeks before, which is like really double sad. And he was an amazing guy, Jeff. He's, he was like from the 60s, like a hippie kind of dude, with a very strong aesthetic. And he just wanted to create a space where people get turned on to weird stuff. And if people want to buy the records, then cool, man. You know, that those kind of places don't really exist anymore. But the fulcrums and the spaces where things happen, because space is where things happen in it. Without a, without a website or a physical space, nothing's going to happen. So London had the uh, sex shop with Malcolm and Vivian, a space where kids met, sparks fly, and like, um, and Liverpool had probe records. So in the post punk period, it was an amazing place. Little steps going up to it, all the freaks, all the weirdos sitting on the steps, and the best and the greatest weirdo of them all, Pete Burns, sat behind the counter. So every time you go in there, we go down from Blackpool with our mini version, what Gavin was doing 
from Liverpool to buy the records we couldn't get in Blackpool. It, it, to go to, I think some people probably know about this, but to, to so every week, every month you go down there, Pete Burns had a completely different look. So the first time you went, he was dressed like a Native American. Second time you went, he was painted yellow with a nappy on and black things in his eyes. Third time you went, it was just another completely far out look. And he used to come in from Port Sunlight, which is like a town that makes soap 20 miles away from Liverpool, and get the train to Liverpool and walk along the dock road. And people, and people up in the, um, and you know what Scouse is like, take the piss. And it's all the dockers there going, you fucking puff or what, mate? And Pete Burns was not camp in the slightest. So Pete Burns would turn around and go, what did you fucking say? And they'd all turn around and go, nothing, nothing. You know, which is great, isn't it? Because normally, like when, in Blackpool, when, we, when people shout stuff like this, they just used to come and beat us up. So we'd like to hear about this kind of weird, exotic superhero figure who could stand his ground <laughs> in Liverpool. So, but he worked behind the counter in Probe Records. Um, when people went to buy their records, he, he, some records he'd just, you know, take the money for. And some he'd go, I'm not, I'm not saying that, it's shite. And like, it, picture discs he hated, he'd smash them on the counter. He'd throw Clash records across the room and he wouldn't allow people to buy certain records. So everybody was terrified of going to the counter. So I was the one who always had to go and buy everyone else's records at the counter and run the gauntlet of the Pete Burns uh, hot, hot treatment, you know. <laughs> um, but he was a key figure as well. I wrote about him in the book because, I mean, obviously, I mean, not but a lot of people wouldn't consider him goth, but a lot of people probably didn't hear his early bands, which is very doorsy, very dark. And even that early uh, Dead Alive period, when there they was like a disco doors thing they were doing, which was their peak moment. So they had a track called Misty Circles. The recorded version's good, but the live version of Future Armor, to this day I can remember that as being one of the greatest pieces of music I've ever heard, like an eight-minute sort of disco dub thing with, with uh, a bit of Donna Summer meeting Jim Morrison, which is almost, in a way, the perfect description of the ultimate goth track, in a sense, isn't it? You know, the idea, there is disco in there, but there's also that kind of classic rock darkness imbued in the grooves and things. So so when I wrote about the chapters about the bands, it was you were still meant to be in the club. So it's like you're on the dance floor, like, you're doing your line, oh, there's all the kind of mad little goth dances and they're not swearing about. And it's like somebody's on speed and they're explaining the cramps to you. And that's what that chapter is, it's, but it's longer than that. So it's, it's, it's a chapter on the cramps, which is about, it's a long chapter, very detailed. And the cramps, of course, didn't form as a goth band, you know, because nobody did. And they, 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 their story is like really, really amazing because on one level, Lux and Ivy is the greatest love story in the history of rock and roll. You know, they were together from the day they met right to the end. And, the, and I, th I think that's another great film, The Ballad of Lux and Ivy, would be a really great sort of rock and roll film. I shouldn't be giving these all away, should I? <laughs> but anyway, so, um, but they met at a psychedelic college in California where, where, they was, where they were studying a course on the magic mushroom god. I think that explains everything about the Cramps that you need to know, really. And they, were, they, were, they are a psychedelic band. They were never psychobilly, even though they made up that term. I think psychobilly makes, tends to make people think there's something that they're not. Their vehicle and their chassis for making psychedelic music was uh, backwards rockabilly, which they got really into, but they, that was filtered through hallucinogenics. And there's something, the first Cramps album is an amazing, very monochromatic, but very amazing psychedelic record. And the reason they seemed to fit into goth was, I mean, the music was great to dance to, so that's one tick. But the first time you ever saw them, you had no idea that they were playing this maybe slightly for laughs. They seemed incredibly serious. The photographs, you only ever saw three photos of them, which are the record sleeves. And they did look like serial killers. They did look like corpses. They didn't look like a normal band. They looked dangerous, you know. So, of course, you thought they were the greatest band in the world, you know, because all the best bands look mad, bad and dangerous to know, don't they? A bit like Lord Byron. So the, so the Cramps totally fitted into the aesthetic of the thing. In fact, their original guitar player, Brian Gregory, was, was quite an influencer on the goth kind of like style. You know, he had the, he had the bone jewellery. He had an amazing look and amazing style. He couldn't play guitar at all, just made noise on it. Even better, that's just perfect. You just make great filthy slabs of sound for um, Poison Ivy to play her amazing little guitar lines over the top of. So they're part of this whole thing as well. And it's, all this, it's kind of weird because all these bands are coming from in from different directions, but they're all embraced in one space at once, and that space was the goth clubs. So all, all the way through the book, it's like 
when you're reading it, yes, listen to all the bands that I mentioned, but also I want you to feel like you're in a golf club and it's like a, it's, you're in a golf club for hours reading this book. And the book, you, you can make your own soundtrack to it, but if you get immersed in the idea this is a club and all these great tracks getting played and all these amazing exotic people are turning up in these clubs, which were not, you know, I mean, back, the Back Cave in London's a famous one, but the Phono in Leeds is the first one. And every town had a golf club, and that's really important to remember as well. So most out-of-the-way places would have... Keighley, Wakefield, Hull, all had a club where people... You saw some of the most amazingly dressed-up people in the most unlikely places. It was exotic places, exotic styles and mundane towns, and it game-changers, I think, you know. And, and I wanted to celebrate all that in the book, and I celebrated all that as well. And I celebrated the way this culture is eternal. So now, instead of being involved in music, it's more in s social media, a lot of it, you know. So you get, you know, TikTok or Instagram, you know, with goth influences on there, with no music on at all. Almost like a return to the 17th century paintings, in a way. It's become a visual form. And, and because it's got such a strong visual... Um, sort of ethic to it, it makes sense in a time where the visuals are actually probably more important than the music. Not not to me, but to um, to a lot of younger people and things. So that's kind of a loose, um, sort of short description of what the book's about. Now it's your turn to ask me a question. <laughs> so is uh, is anybody is anybody got a question? Is there anybody? Oh, at the back. I mean, that's one of the reasons I, I did the book because people didn't talk about it enough, and it was kind of being sort of written out of history, hadn't it? I mean, obviously, music fans have a different story than media, don't they? We 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 embrace a lot of different styles of music. We understand styles of music. We we like a lot of different things. But when you when you read things of the time you grew up in, you think they've missed a chunk of stuff out there because it doesn't fit into their their kind of story. Now it's interesting you mentioned that the, the, the bands in Manchester and the, you know. What did, um, you sort of the bands to slightly to the side of goth, or goths like those bands, but they weren't necessarily goth. And I did write about them in the book, like Smiths and, and Chameleons as well. Um, I mean, Johnny Marr, I interviewed him in the book, because, I mean, Johnny is amazing on pop culture, and he's he's definitely a person who understands why you wear a pair of socks to listen to a certain record. And he was a big fan of Bauhaus, and a big fan of all that kind of music. And also, what people forget about Johnny, because some people said to me, why is Johnny Marr in your book? I said, well, he actually managed the, the, the uh, goth shop. I managed, do you remember X Clothes? Well, Johnny was a manager. He was, six, he was a 16-year-old whiz kid managing that shop who, who didn't let anybody else play any other music in there. He, he said... He owned, he, the only reason he wanted to be the manager so he could control what got played in the shop, which is very Johnny, isn't it? Cause, and also you would let him because he knows music inside out and things. So, and there, there was a, I mean, the Smiths, there's a, there's a melancholy to the Smiths, even though they're funny, there's a melancholy to them as well, which kind of, that you'd understand if you had a, a goth aesthetic to you. Now, the Chameleons are a really interesting band, aren't they? Because a lot of people in the goth scene really like them. But they didn't fall into, again, they didn't fall into a bit of goth band, but they, they, they saw themselves saw themselves as being closer maybe to Teardrop Explodes in Liverpool bands, but they brought a heaviness to that as well. And it, makes, it reminds me of something that Andrew Eldritch once said in an interview I did with him, that he didn't, I mean, obviously he doesn't see himself as being a goth, but he saw it as being the M62 sound. So the M62 is the motorway that joins Liverpool, uh, Manchester and Leeds together, and, if you t and then through to Hull. But if you take a little detour, you can sort of, get Sheffield counted in there as well. The four great northern cities who all each got very interesting post-punk scenes, which they felt an affinity with and a kinship with. So Eldritch said the gig that was a game changer for him, and this is an amazing bill when you think about it, was Per Rubu supported by the Human League in the early days of the Human League. It's like, wow, you cannot imagine those two bands playing together at all. But it's like when you look at those old flyers, those four band bill flyers from gigs in London, 
in uh, you know those sort of Lyceum shows or whatever. And all the bands, you think, wow, those four bands actually playing on one bill, that's insane. So, so the chameleons were, so they were like that. They're probably very more, more an M62 kind of, I'm starting to use this term now because I quite like it, an M62 kind of band. And, um, and the other interesting thing about them, apart from being a great band, and still being a great band, and probably at, um, as, as good sound as good now as he ever did, was I don't know if you saw the Sex Pistols last gig documentary on TV when they played Huddersfield in um, Christmas Day 1977. They did a benefit for the striking firemen's children. Which is which is great, you know. It's, it's not like the image that the tabloids like to present of what the Sex Pistols were, and it's an amazing gig. And there's a Christmas cake there, and he gets smashed in Johnny Rotten's face, and he's smeared all over him. There's loads of great iconic photographs of it. Julian Temple filmed the whole gig, made a documentary about it. So I'm watching it, and I'm thinking, God, that kid looks familiar in there. That's, it looks like Mark Burgess for the Chameleons. No way can that be him. So I just emailed him and said. That's not you in the pistols thing, Mark, and it is. <laughs> when he's about 16, he hitchhiked from Manchester over to Huddersfield on Christmas Day, 1977. He said there's only one car all day because nowadays people go and see, drive around on Christmas Day. But in them days, if you remember, no, nobody did anything, did they? I don't know. He was really lucky to get there. And he got there for the matinee show, and he's there all day. And he's the one chucking the Christmas cake around. So now, when I rewatch, it's like <laughs> there he is. It's like his, his little moment in pop cultural history. So it's interesting to mention all that stuff in Manchester. You know, like you know, like I mean, from Joy Division all the way through those bands, there was definitely. I mean, all the bands, of course, knew each other, but there was definitely some kind of aesthetic where they sort of join. They do. They do fit together in a way that makes a logic to somebody who actually lived there and went through it. The Banshee was a great place. Well, that was like one of the main goth clubs in Manchester. And the Ritz was the biggest night, the Monday night, the Ritz, which went for about 30 years, that guy DJ there, was, was like, it, it had a big, long sort of goth period as well, didn't it? That venue's still there, actually, yeah. Question. Um, talking kind of at, at the top of like goth being a, a retroactive term, and, and a lot of bands that are considered kind of like the, the epitome of goth music not at all identifying with it. Is it possible in like the modern contemporary, I don't know if it's talked about in the book, but like to, is modern goth a thing or future goth a thing or is it purely within the period sort of no, I think it's it's an eternal thing. I think as a as a feeling, isn't it? So, like I think as like I said before, but people were dealing with their blues, whatever contemporary art was at hand. When it's in that period, it was electric rock and roll, which is now you know there's, there's, there's goth bands now, modern goth bands. There's also EBM, like dark dance music as well, electronic sort of goth music. But also it kind of it kind of emerges in weird, really weird places. So like I said, with social networking, of course, you get those goth influences, don't you? Standing in a forest, dressed in amazing goth clothes, with no inkling of any music at all. It just looks good which to me is valid i think that's that's totally valid as well you know because it an art form or a feeling a feeling could be so powerful you could put it in any art form possible it's, it's goth gaming isn't it? you know, there's goth you know there's, there's films or you know famously uh, tim burton the world's number one sort of goth ambassador just did that wednesday series and put the cramps back in the mainstream you know because he's always trying to sneak all, all those bands in there isn't he so you know in 50 years time there'll still be they might be called something different, but there'll be there'll still be a dark cultural vibe. They'll still be attractive because there's something about the human human nature that we find that fascinating. Like night or days, you know, they're both they're both fascinating in completely different ways. And I think the saying that really escapulates this maybe is um, that uh, it's that they who fear death cannot celebrate life, which I think is such a great way to live your life thinking that you know. So, you know, once you've embraced death and the fact that you're not really here forever and every second's incredibly precious, you better cram them up with good experiences, you know. So, and, it's, and a lot of people I know who, you know, when I, I interviewed Wilco Johnson, he's four weeks before he died, and he said the uh, leaves on the trees never look so green. You know, instead of just walking past and not even noticing it, suddenly everything became vivid and in full colour and every, every sense was like jangling because it had to be because you've got to cram it in because, you, you know, he didn't have much time left. And he said, he, then I interviewed him a year later, and he said what really fucked his head up was actually getting to the other side and surviving. He said, found that harder to cope with than with a death sentence and things. So, well, so, well, goth, yeah, I think, also the term, I think, no band likes to be termed as a thing, do they? Because instantly, once you're in a scene, you get, not everybody, because most people in scenes, you know, are, you know, not stupid. And they have like, 
that they have a, a fluid idea of culture. You know, you like stuff. You can like stuff that doesn't even fit into what you're meant to like. You just like it, don't you? And that's the way it is. But there's also the scene police, isn't there? You know, go, if you're a golf band, how come your guitar player's not got black trousers on? You know, it's, it gets a bit like that. So it gets, and it becomes like micro and it shrinks down. And, you know, then some of the bands that come afterwards will only copy the bands that are already in the scene where the bands, the original bands had a wider pool of influences because nobody actually knew what the scene was. So I can see how that's really annoying to people that, you know, that people get, you, people imprison you within a scene but really, when people say goth, or anybody in this room says goth, we're not trying to imprison any bands in the scene, are we? So the way I would use it is a, is a shorthand term to describe a feeling or a nuance or a colour or, or a piece of music um, as quickly as possible. So if you said to me, like, we've got, you know, as we're all going home later, we've got 20 seconds. You say, there's a brilliant band coming out in the middle of Ireland and, and we, we're called, oh, Rush, what's what they like? You're not going to give me a 600-word description. You're going to go kind of gothy post-punk and shout the name and I'll go and look them up. And that's what we use it for, isn't it? We use it as shorthands. We don't... If I said to you, Sister Mercy of Goth, you don't instantly imprison them in the prison of Goth, do you? You just think... You know, you just think, well, that, yeah, um, that chimes to me. Uh, you know, that makes sense. You know, we know what we mean. And I think people get too prissy about it sometimes. But I understand why. Because a true artist should never be imprisoned at all, should they? Yeah. Next. Your book is quite big. It's been six months pages. And you have three hundred references. Sorry, 300 references. Which part of the research was the worst for you to do? <laughs> the, the worst is editing it. Just go. The worst was taking it out because that book's about half the length of what it was when it was written. So trying to take because at that point in time it was going to come out on um, omnibus. We're going to do it, and they put a word limit on it. And so I had to go back and try and. It was about three hundred and forty thousand words. I keep chopping stuff out. And then I fell out with Omni, but to put it out myself, but I didn't have enough time to put it all back in again because the editing process is insane. And even when you, you edit it over and over again, there's still annoying things that slip through which do your head in. So the editing's a bit I find really, really like boring. Um, the bit I found quite interesting, even though it was much harder work than I thought it was going to be, was doing the audio book, which, which is out next month, whatever. And um, I thought, well, that'll take me about a week, but it took about seven weeks of every day. Because I don't know if you have you ever read stuff out loud. It's really difficult, isn't it? You're kind of reading it, and for the first 20 minutes, you're reading it fine. And then you start tripping over words that you can normally say. You know, and you keep going back to them. So what the guy who's editing is, he's getting this thing, you know, have you got to say, say the line was the guy's editing. The guy's editing. <laughs> The guys, I can't, God, I can't say, fuck this, editing, editing, fucking, fucking, fucking word. So, and then I go back 10 minutes later and it'd be in a different way of saying it and things. So, and then also because the book's got lots of references to 15th, 16th century writers in it and place names, how do you check that? I mean, there's no way of checking them. So I'm going online, I found some of them, but I couldn't find all of them. Some of them are so obscure. Because actually on YouTube, there is some places where people actually pronounce words properly. So I don't know who thought of putting that up. Because, you know, the internet's got nearly everything on it, which is madness, isn't it? But there was some that were so obscure that even that didn't have it either. So I'm kind of hoping I got them right. So I was just, I was thinking, my only get out is if somebody says, you've pronounced that wrong. Or I said, well, I'm from the north of England. I'm so, that's how we say it up here. <laughs> you know, when we, when we go out and about around town, this is how we pronounce 14th century Italian philosophers. <laughs> Is there something very British about goth? I'm just thinking, like, I'm, I'm British, I did an island cross, I'm very British and Irish. I, maybe I just don't know this. I've got, I've got it hard to imagine French goth or German goth. Put it, put it like that. So, is, is there, you know, like, what's it about Britain? But... Um. I think Britain and Ireland, like I said before, I think that culturally, I think that there's so many crossovers, you know, I think. Um, when, when I, I, there's not really a word to say, a word that doesn't piss everybody off. But let's say this corner, this this dark, dark dreary, bad weather corner of Europe, of Ireland and Britain, this little collection of islands, culturally does like to make stuff up, and it does. And there is a fascination what things look like as well, you know. And I think that's part and parcel of it as well. And I think also we 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 tend to think of it as being a thing. You know, whereas other countries, there were people before dressing in black in bands, but you wouldn't think they were part 
of a movement or a scene. And we, even though everybody hates the idea of it being goth and a scene, everybody also quite likes the idea of it being a scene. And it like like this this kind of army of freaks or whatever. We like that kind of stuff. You know, we like we like creating these little tribes and, and little weird. You know, the, the tribal culture is really important in England. You know? And it's an interesting thing. Maybe maybe some in the sociology department could work that out for us. You know. But um, but there were there were outliers, you know. There were people on the places doing this. In America, there was things going on, but they were slightly after, you know. They they you know bands like Christian Death, you know, they would say they were like, um, you know, they they were like, you know, one of the first bands doing it. But they they were about a year afterwards, and they were they did have an eye on what was going on in Britain, but did their own version of it. But uh, interesting enough, the main guy in Christian Death's actually I thought he's from L.A. But he's actually from Middlesbrough, which must be the world's most opposite version of L.A. possible, wasn't it? So it's um. And you know, the, I mean, obviously the cramps were like mainstays to it, and people could say misfits, but the misfits weren't that known in England at the time. They were just, they were just a footnote of a band that supported the Dams in uh, the Dams' first gigs in America. And that's you thought, well, that's, that's interesting. I never heard of them, but you, you couldn't really get their record, you know. So, but like now, people who are younger think they're one of the most important influential punk bands of all time. But well, that, that was 20 years later. It wasn't at that point in time. So. So there were, I mean, you could argue that Eisters and Neubart in, in Germany were a version of it as well, a German version of it. They, they were obviously 100% would claim we didn't have any idea what those people in England were doing, you know. But I think, I think they probably were listening a little bit, you know. And stylistically, they were, I mean, everything about them would be classic goth, and you would hear them in goth clubs as well. They didn't really fill the dance floor, of course, you know. But their records sounded amazing. They were kind of records you could go, to, you go home and listen to at four in the morning, like mad clattering, amazing soundscapes they create and things like that. And also Nick Cave in Australia as well. But, but I don't think there was anything. I mean, when they started, they were they were like very Roxy music. Then they, then they went, they came to the UK and became a hundred times more intense. So, what, did they pick up some energy here to change what they were doing? I think they probably did. Would they admit it? No. Would they say they were goth? Certainly not. But Release the Bats was written to be played on the dance floor of um, the Bat Cave when Nick Cave went every week, which he sort of doesn't really mention now. But but well, I don't see what's wrong with that. Why not? You know, it's great. It's just such a great track. It sounds amazing. And it became a goth club staple. So as soon as that track came out, they went from being uh, a John Peel kind of weird band to being quite a big band to people like doing crazy dances in goth clubs and things like that. So I think... Generalisation is difficult. You have to be very careful not to put everything in broad strokes. I think, I think we, things coalesce here and we make them into things. You know, we make them into scenes in our heads. But there are outliers in other places as well, which they could go. Hang on a minute, what about us? You know, so and a lot of synchronicity goes on as well, doesn't it? Like people seem to arrive at the same place without knowing what other people are doing. Whereas now with the internet, you kind of know what everyone's doing, don't you? But then, I mean, I don't think Bauhaus or Sister Mercy would be aware of each other, you know, or, you know, Nick Cave wouldn't be aware of Christian Death. You know, they wouldn't be aware of each other. They'd just be going in their direction, the energy of punk, chaos, man, whoa, let's go, let's go over here. And when you get to over here to that, the treasured land, Jesus, loads of other people here. Where do they come from? But that must be quite annoying. So maybe that's another reason why people hate the term goth, isn't it? But you're right. So I think this, our, our little uh, damp corner of Europe, um, is very good at creating pop cultural scenes and also weirdly very embarrassed about it you know we chuck them in the bin really quickly and then you go to other countries and they're huge aren't they you go to brazil punk and mods and and, and goth are all really popular mexico you know bands bands play british bands in mexico of these kind of genres will play to forty thousand people at a gig in mexico you know mexico city which which is like the, of all the cities i've been to see the most goths were like walking around you know it really connects them there you know so so yeah, it's, it's it's weird. It's probably good that we can move on really quickly, but where do we ever get to in the end? You know, we should embrace all this cool stuff that we invented. It's 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 our Britain and Ireland. It's it's our calling card, soft power, isn't it? Wherever you go in the world that that's got in the pop culture kind of sphere, knows that we do good good stuff in pop culture. You know, and it's something that we should be you know, pleased about instead of like going, oh, no, I'm not into that. You know, which that kind of odd sort of awkwardness we have about it. Yeah. Question? Well, I think uh, you were just putting things together, uh, and I also think that you know, Pop Rock uh, has never went out. I just wait, wait, not. 
It's the most powerful art form, isn't it? It's, um, yeah. Oh, yeah, but it's... Because uh, you'd say you don't trust so much punk now, but as soon as you walked in, I thought that guy was a punk. You know, I think there's, there's just something about people who were so um, so changed in that period that there was just something about the way people look and the pe way people walk. You can always spot it for years. You know, for years going around places, you can spot the people who went through that thing because it was really powerful, wasn't it? You know, it was, I don't think the people who started it in London had any idea how powerful it was. In all, all these outposts, you know, when there was only five of you. <laughs> See, I, I don't really care what the format is, I just want the music. Yep. Yeah. I mean, vinyls, I mean, it's aesthetically pleasing, isn't it? It looks nice. But I never go home, so I have to listen to stuff on my phone. But I, I, I've got headphones and I'm listening to music. It's it's the best place in the world to be. So I always have my headphones on with me and I always have my phone and that. Yeah. But I, I agree, like music, it's, it's so immersive and so powerful, isn't it? And it's so frustrating to try and make it because you can never make the music yourself as good. <laughs> yeah. We should... We <laughs> Getting a little, little, little ear pads. <laughs> well, thanks, that was a good observation. Okay, time for maybe two more questions. Question, question, question. Yeah. One. Are we doing a Dutch auction and going backwards? <laughs> yeah, You've already asked me loads this afternoon. <laughs> you do research in this area for years. And actually, my favourite question is what the worst parts of research? Uh, for me, is of all the stories you learned in your research in the book, of all the anecdotes, what was most interesting, what was most surprising, what was something that you had not known or actually won when you were received? Well, because, because I kind of knew all the stuff before I started, there was no story I thought I'd never heard that before. But it was more the way it kind of affected people, which, which is kind of new, and it was good to hear people talk about it. It was interesting how far, how what, much wider it was as well, musically and, and artistically. And it was interesting creating that, not creating, but maybe writing about that lineage that goes through hundreds of years of centuries. And it's just another period in, in, in art, in its own few hundred years' time, whenever they've gone to the next kind of media, or say in, in that period of time, they're just to music, how weird. You know, well, well, by then, they're still just to music, but there wouldn't be the portal. For, for these kind of feelings and these kind of ideas and things. So it's like, there was, so there was no like one story I thought, you know, I was, I was, I'm completely shocked by that, but I've been so involved in me for so long and heard so, everything about everything. That's, I mean, it's not, there's nothing left that can shock me now. I mean, every, every story that turns up, there's a bigger shocking story on Twitter. You kind of go, yeah, well, I knew that. I already heard that. There's a few more that I can't really say yet. <laughs> Ah. I have a second go. One or two songs just that you haven't mentioned already that you just love from all of this or just like mean something to you or Well I did I, did, I mentioned Bella Gozi, which I think is such a key track, you know, I think it's really important. We, we were playing Pagan Love Song by Virgin Prunes on the radio show this afternoon and it sound, always sounds great. But I think maybe the record I think um 
is really underestimated. Not underestimated, but not talked about enough is the first Banshee's album. Because I think because Susie is so iconic, you know, and she looks so amazing and she's, you know, part of, part of the culture. She's, she's like a national treasure, which you probably hate that as well. But, you know, that thing that everybody kind of knows who she is and she was so influential to so many people stylistically that people don't talk about the music enough. And when they do, they talk about the, the period when the band had hits, which is great and they sounded fantastic then. But the album that was probably most influential musically, especially on the bands we talk about here, is the first album, Scream. I think just the actual sonics of it are amazing. I think Steve Lillywhite's production, which is the first thing he produced, is really good. It, it kind of, it's, it's that thing in post-punk where everybody's playing lead at the same time, and and it doesn't clash and it all fits together, and and even the drums you can sing the drum parts in your head, you know, that which which a lot of post-punk did as well. So that sense of space, that sense of dynamic, that spend, that sense of. Um, a tension in it as well, you know, tension release, which in punk was amazing because most people were full on in punk. And to have a record that at the time was seen as being one, you know, here's, here's one of the key punk bands who brought a record that didn't sound like a punk record but felt like a punk record. I think, I think John McKay's guitar sound is amazing, that sort of um, chiming, sort of glass kind of sound. I think he instigated that, he never gets the credit for it. I think the drummer, whatever happened to him, but I think he's. he's dr- <laughs> He's in Cork somewhere, yeah. I think he's, he's, he's I know he's, he's in Cork, yeah. Yeah, somewhere in Cork. But he's, he's, he's um, but the start of drumming, that tribal sound was one that people emulated from so many other records. I mean, Stephen Morris, no relation, um, and, and Joy Division will say, will tell you that that's a drum that really influenced him, and that style of drumming that he plays across Joy Division, you know. So I think a record like that is, is, is probably not celebrated enough, it's probably overshadowed by all the other aspects of the band. Yeah. Um, not a question, but a suggestion. Uh, if you're looking for new music, a friend of mine um, is in a band called Eros Blindfold, and they recently put out their EP Mutt. Um, it's been described as industrial, ne- industrial like neo folk. It's very weird. She's, yeah, they've got like some like of like Bowie's more experimental weird shit influence in there. It's very very fun, and it's on awesome. Spotify. Oh, that's made my night. That's industrial neo folk. I, I know it just sounds in my head. I'm, I'm, I'm playing in my head now, and it sounds amazing. Well, what, what are they called? Uh, Aero. Aero. Can you spell it? Aero. Aero. E R O S. E R O S. Blindfold. So Eros, like the Greek god. Yeah, Eros blindfold. Well, I've got to look that up. I've had so many great new band tips today. Yeah, because that's the thing, it doesn't stop, does it? I mean, it's great writing a book about the history of music, but I don't want to be, I don't want to live in that period forever. I want to, I want to hear the next thing, because that's what you're doing at the time, wasn't it? it was, it, you know, it's, you always want to hear the next thing, to put all the stuff that you really liked into, into a context as well, isn't it? It's, it's just a never-ending flow, isn't it, of, of culture. We're, just, we're lucky that we can access it and hear it, isn't it? So where are they based? Are they Cork? Uh, Limerick. Limerick. But like, well, <laughs> that's where he's from, yeah. Yeah, See, it's amazing, isn't it? Because when I was talking about sort of small places where music came out of, I was talking about big towns, and you're talking about a place with 26 houses in it. Whereas, it, whereas now, if I'm, I'm really imagining what they sound like, it could be the next band that changes everything. <laughs> no pressure. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I think um, I think you got your money's worth there, since it was free to get in. <laughs> so if you want to buy a book, I'll be hovering over there, or just come and give me some new band tips. But um, thank you. Um, um, on behalf of the library, I'd like to thank you all for coming. I also want to thank John. He's been fantastic. I've had a great day with John today. So, and as he said, his book is over there, and you probably already know he'll be in the Crane Lane later. He'll be doing a DJ set, so he'd love to see some of you there. I know there's library staff have meetings tomorrow morning, so unfortunately I won't be there, but it'll be a great night. Thank you all for coming. Cheers. Thanks.